like yesterday, um, you'll have realized the teaching style is not to get lost in technical detail and to avoid equations wherever possible and try and understand concepts because you can get the other stuff from books and papers. So it's continuing in that style. And I think what we can try and do by doing all of these different techniques within a very short period of time is see that they're not so different. Um, so at first glance, unit selection and HMM synthesis seem radically different. One's a statistical machine learning and one's, you know, the cheating, cut and paste. Um, but they're not so different because the way you choose the units and the, the way that you construct your statistical model are very, very similar. Um, and it's all to do with how we query the linguistic context to find either a suitable unit or a suitable model. And I think we can hopefully continue seeing that into DNN synthesis as well. It's all about how we probe or query the linguistic context. In other words, how do we represent the context and which bits matter and which bits don't matter? So to make that super clear, I'm actually going to recap very quickly my view of unit selection, which hopefully is harmonious with the one yesterday, and so we can smoothly make this transition into HMM synthesis. So um, <clears throat> we're going to have a quick look again at unit selection and pick out the key concept of unit selection, which is in fact going to be the same as the key concept of HMM synthesis. Um, and it's all about turning an almost infinite set of possible linguistic contexts into some finite set that we can then pull out of a database or find a model for. And that finite set might be flexible in its size depending on the data we have to support the building of it. <clears throat> and again, we're going to repeat that speech synthesis could be seen as a regression problem, a really difficult regression problem, and just um, narrow down a little bit the scope of where we can actually apply the machine learning to the regression problem and where we still do lots of um, intuitive, knowledge-driven engineering in the features. So we don't actually put text into the TTS system and we don't actually get speech out. We narrow the scope of that a little bit and engineer the two ends of that. And I'm sure Hager tomorrow will tell us a bit about how we can expand back out and get certainly closer to the waveform on the far end of the machine learning. Let's just be 100% clear we're okay with terminology because these, there's terrible terminology in the field um, which has been invented organically and <clears throat> there's some potentially conflicting uh, or confusing terminology. So in speech synthesis, the, the standard unit, and it's okay just to assume that kind of all speech synthesis systems use diphones. If they don't, they probably use half phones, but with a strong preference to trying to make diphones out of them. Um, so to a strong preference to not to make joins at phone boundaries. Um, so unit selection uses diphone size units. Unfortunately, there is a form of speech synthesis called diphone speech synthesis, which is the same thing except with only one copy of each diphone. But that's, that's the first bit of confusing terminology. So diphone is a type of speech unit. It's not a method of speech synthesis really, but it gets used in that way. So that's what that means. Unit selection we understand from yesterday. So let's say they both use diphones. We might generalize that, but it's okay just to say that. Um, we're going to use some other units um, now in HMM synthesis. We're going to use, in fact, probably going to use quin phones, and then we're actually going to make them something more than quin phones. So let's just be clear what the difference in these things is. And if you know this, that's good. If you don't, it's worth recapping it. So here's a, some speech, and it's got the boundaries of the segments, the boundaries of the phones. So phones are the tokens, phonemes are the classes. And so a diphone goes from the middle of one to the middle of the next. So that's a diphone, and we might call that diphone. So these labels go at the end of segments. That's the, that's the convention. So this is the second half of this and the first half of this. So this might be this diphone here. That's fine. Triphones are a little different. So here's the segment called this. And a triphone is exactly the same shape and size as a phone. It's just a context-dependent copy or version of that. So it's a rather confusing, diphones and triphones. And then we won't get into biphones because we're not sure what those are. So we might want to give names to triphones. We might want to have some notation to talk about them. So we'll use HDK-style notation because that's the only standard available and it's perfectly sensible. And we might have something like... This is this segment, this phone, in the context of Z afterwards, 
and D before. But remember, it's still a model of a phone sized unit. It's just there's many, many different models of this unit depending on the context it appears in. And you can, of course, generalize that by adding the next, next phone and the previous, previous phone. So plus or minus two will give you quin phones. Quin is five. And you can go on from that if you want, but quin phones will do for us. It's also worth recapping that there's been an implicit assumption in everything we do in, in speech processing, everything that most people do most of the time, the mainstream, and that's to pretend that speech is this string of units that we can draw boundaries and segment it. And you'll have discovered if you try and do that on speech, it's not quite true. It's really quite hard to draw those boundaries. However, it, for engineering purposes, it's extraordinarily convenient to make this assumption that we can s represent this continuous signal, this waveform that's continuously changing and really doesn't have many discontinuities except things like stop closures, as a discrete sequence of symbols. Because if we don't do that, we're not sure what to do. And it's close enough to the truth that it works, and we can make it even close to the truth by making those units context-sensitive, context-dependent such as instead of pretending that speech is a string of phones, saying it's a string of triphones, and it's now closer to the truth. Okay? It's still problematic where the times of those boundaries are, but it's closer to the truth in the set of units that there is. Now, there isn't just 45 units, there's many, many thousands of types. So the key is all context, and it's all about context. And in unit selection, in HMM synthesis and DNN synthesis, it's all about discovering what the context is. In other words, what affects the current realization of this current sound that we're in, and what doesn't? Because if it doesn't, we don't need to make the model sensitive to that aspect of the context. So how can we possibly know what all these contexts are? And if we just write down the product of all the possible linguistic environments that a sound can appear in, and even if we just restrict ourselves to within a sentence, <clears throat> there are an infinite number of possible sentences in every language, because you can say anything, and you can always invent a new sentence, and therefore, there's an infinite possible set of linguistic contexts in which a sound can appear. And therefore, if we make a sound sensitive to its entire context, we have an infinite set of classes, which is going to be pretty inconvenient. We could never collect training examples of them all. So it's all about dealing with this infinite variety of linguistic contexts and collapsing it to a finite and hopefully reasonably small number of contexts that we can do something with, such as store units of, make models of or write symbolic representations of the context of. And there's one key concept <clears throat> that's assumed across all of, all of speech synthesis, and it would be impossible to do speech synthesis if, this, if we couldn't make this assumption, and that's that it's not the complete context that matters. What matters is what effect it has on the current sound. So if something in the context changes, such if we change a word four words away in the current sentence, but that doesn't make any difference to the current sound. That context doesn't matter. So we don't need to multiply all the different contexts by that factor. So it's as, as much as about discovering what contexts don't matter as what contexts do matter. And then making this mapping from the infinite to the finite. And so we need to discover then automatically whether a particular contextual factor, whether it's the previous phone or the stress of three syllables in the past, or whether the current sentence is a question or a statement, whatever the context factor is, does it change the current sound or not? Now, probably all contexts make some change on the current sound, but maybe not a significant one. So we're going to have to make approximations here. This, this is reality. So it's those that have no perceivable effect or no effect that's worth modeling. So this linguistic context is a complicated beast because it's uh, many time scales and many linguistic levels. And so um, yesterday in the lab, you built a unit selection voice. And in that unit selection voice, there are these mysterious things called utterances, utterance objects, these dot ut files. And if you are brave enough to look inside one, you realize they're, they're not human friendly, but they are a representation of linguistic structure. They've got all sorts of exciting types of structure and they've got simple sequences such as the phonetic string. They've got tree-like structures, such as how phones make up syllables that make up words. And they've got relationships between strings of things and trees of things. So strings of phones belong to tree-like structures of syllables and words. So here's a picture that attempts to capture some of that. This is my, in a nutshell, simplified 
utterance object, the linguistic structure. So that's a very heterogeneous object. It's got different types of things in it. And it's not really obvious how to start doing statistical modeling with this kind of mixed bag of things. And remember that in the front end, we said in the front end, you can extract all sorts of things from the text. You think it matters, you extract it from the text. And you might extract a tree, a parse tree. You might extract boundaries of things between words. And you, you might have all different representations of these things. That's fine. You might represent them in the most linguistically intuitive way, but it might not be immediately obvious how to map that onto a statistical model. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our, uh, our assumption that speech is a linear string of things, a linear string of context-dependent things, and we're going to convert this structured linguistic stru object, this utterance, into a linear string of things. And the string is going to be rooted around the basic unit of sound, the phone, and we're going to attach all the other context to the phone. So I like to call this flattening. We're going to flatten the context. So we're going to take this deep linguistic structure and we're just going to squash it. And everything that's above the phone gets squashed and attached to it. This is not linguistically very sophisticated. This, isn't, this loses structure. It loses, it loses information. But it's convenient for uh, modeling. Okay. So we've now converted rich linguistic structures into a sequence of symbols. And the symbols are going to be rather complicated because they're going to be phones with all sorts of things attached to them. And the names are going to look really messy. But there'll be a string of things with boundaries in between, a string of isolated, separate. Maybe we can make the assumption they're statistically <laughs> independent. And so the key is then of all these many different types we've created, because flattening linguistic structure onto the phone string creates many new types. It's the product of all the different factors. So the seemingly possibly infinite number of types we're going to now discover amongst this infinite set of types what the actual natural classes of sound are. In other words, which things sound the same. So that when we, for example, in unit selection, take a unit out of a linguistic context, out of one sentence that we recorded, and play it back in a different sentence, in a different linguistic context, nobody notices. It sounds the same as it would have sounded if recorded in that context. So it's equivalent or nearly equivalent or imperceptibly equivalent. And that's what we're aiming for. So that's what unit selection is all about. If you can't find the unit you want, go and find one that's sufficiently similar, and you measure that with some handcrafted thing called a target cost. And that target cost is a function of the linguistic context. It might be as simple in festival as a weighted sum of mismatches. So every time there's something different in the linguistic context, you incur a penalty, and that's weighted by how important you think that mismatch is. So if the next phone mismatches, you get a big penalty, because that's probably important. So that's the key to your section. We've got this thing called the target cost. I'm going to fly through some slides that are there in the pack for you on the website if you want to follow along, just like yesterday. And it's all about crafting a target cost that appropriately uses these criteria. We also have mentioned, and Spiros mentioned in his unit selection talk, um, we can go that step further in, in, in unit selection. Instead of using symbolic features, use acoustic features. So we need to do effectively what's partial synthesis. Now, for unit selection, it doesn't matter if we synthesize something that we can't get to the waveform from, it doesn't have to be a comprehensive representation of the signal. It just has to be something that's useful for measuring distance. So some acoustic space where we can measure difference. So we don't need a full vocoder specification. We could do something simpler. For example, MFCCs, which are not the most convenient thing to synthesize a waveform from, but are quite good for measuring acoustic distance. But if you're going to do partial synthesis, why not just do all, go the whole way? If you're making all of these steps down your journey, instead of stopping at some point and concatenating units, why not just go the whole hog and actually generate speech? And that's what we're going to do. So in HMM synthesis, we're going to take those extra steps to get to a comprehensive acoustic specification. And then we're going to use that to drive a vocoder. We're not going to say much about vocoding here because we've already heard about that in the lecture. And here's where we stop doing statistical modeling and draw a line and hand over to feature engineering. So the vocoder is an engineered object. It's designed by an expert engineer with good intuitions about the speech signal and how it works, how to deconstruct it and reconstruct it. And that's handcrafted. That's expert, a crafted object. It's a cra crafted uh, piece, piece of machinery. And maybe later we could talk about how you might go even further with the machine learning and get closer and closer to the waveform, maybe all the way to the waveform. So that's engineering, and this is machine learning, and the front end we've seen already is all engineering. 
It might be made out of bits of machine learning, but it's as an object, it's an engineered, a crafted thing, a made, a made thing. And the machine learning is then in the middle. It's between linguistic features that have been engineered and vocoder parameters which have been engineered. So that's what we're going to constrain ourselves to now. We're going to do this. We're going to use regression to get from the linguistic features to the waveform. We won't actually get all the way to the waveform. We'll stop at some point short of a waveform, and that's going to be our vocoder parameters. So the vocoder makes that last step to get to some waveform we can play back. And this thing in the front end has already been made. So we're going to get from here, flattened onto the phonemes, to the vocoder parameters. So that's definitely regression. Symbols in, continuous values out. Okay. So there's lots of examples out there you can find of, of good parametric synthesis. I'm not going to play you necessarily state-of-the-art samples. We're not going to listen to a lot here because there's, there's, we won't hear big differences over the sound system here. But let's listen to the sort of quality you could easily make yourself with the, the available the tools, the tools that you can get freely. So things like the HDS toolkit for building the models, the straight vocoder for doing the vocoding, or any other vocoder you like. So we'll just listen to a few, a few of those just to get an idea of what things sound like. Statistical parametric oh. speech synthesis is actually... Let's try that again. Statistical parametric speech synthesis is actually more intelligible than unit selection. So hopefully it doesn't sound as good as unit selection. You hopefully can hear that's been vocoded. Not super well. Statistical parametric speech synthesis can use high quality data. So that sounds a bit better. But also works well with more variable recordings. So it's clearly different to unit selection. There's no concatenation artifacts because there's no concatenation per se. Um, but there is obvious vocoding effects there. But with a better vocoder, you would expect it to do better there. Those are not state-of-the-art examples. Those are the sorts of quality you could build yourself from two to four hours of data, say. So there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different angles we could come at um, HMM speech synthesis to try and understand it. <clears throat> so what we'll do, we'll come at it from a few different angles, and maybe one of them will make the most sense to you. Um, the first way of thinking about it is to think look, we've got a vocoder and the vocoder can code speech and reconstruct it. So that's something that's often called copy synthesis. And we'll often do that anyway to test the vocoder. And we might often do it uh, for the purposes of evaluation to set some top line because that's the best we could ever achieve with HMM synthesis. We can't exceed the quality of just vocoding the natural speech. So one way of understanding Statistical parametric speech synthesis is to say it's a kind of a speech coder, a vocoder, that takes speech in and produces eventually speech out. Um, but whereas a speech coder, a vocoder, or a, a, a coder like kelp or, or something else, its purpose is to compress or encode the speech so we can transmit it or store it efficiently. So we're going to encode it as some sequence of features, speech features, and we're going to do something like transmit it, and then we're going to reconstruct from a sequence of features, the same features, possibly with errors introduced by the transmission or the compression. And we're just going to break that chain, and instead of just storing them, we're going to distill them. We're going to do a very special form of compression. We're going to compress them into a statistical model that makes a relationship between the text and the features, and then we're going to store that model. And then later, at any time uh, of our convenience, we can retrieve that stored model and given only the text, we can decompress the speech. So if you're a speech coding person, if you like to think of speech as something you can compress and uncompress, maybe this is one way of thinking of what statistical parametric speech synthesis does. It's kind of the ultimate speech compression. It compresses it into something that's text and then decompresses it. If we're going to do that, we've got to model this coded representation. So we're never going to model directly the waveform. Um, at least until maybe we get to very advanced DNN synthesis. And even then, that's still not working as well as modeling these vocoder parameters. 
So we're actually going to model the vocoder parameters themselves, as we saw in, in the first lecture. So we're going to model the F0, the intensity, the spectral envelope. And we're going to, of course, need some model of duration. So we're going to have statistical models. And the models are going to be of some linguistic unit. We've already decided we'll use phonemes as linguistic category. So these are models of context-dependent phones. And they're each going to generate some duration of speech at some fixed frame rate. This fixed frame rate is more convenient than doing things at variable frame rate, which is always very messy. And then this is the job of the vocoder. We don't need to worry about that because we already understand that. So that's one view. Don't necessarily think it's the easiest way to think about what um, statistical parametric synthesis does. It's not a very obvious form of speech compression. So what we're going to do now is take two other views that are much more helpful. And I'm going to give you first the conventional view, which is the sort of procedural view. It's the view of how you actually build a system. And it's the view that comes from automatic speech recognition, which is where all of this stuff is borrowed from. Is that Yanis with a question or a stretching? Stretching. So let's start with this procedural sort of mechanistic, what happens when we try and build a system where we'd like to train a statistical model of every phone in every possible linguistic context, realize why that's impossible, and then fix it. Find a solution to that problem. And that solution is borrowed directly from automatic speech recognition. That will help us understand what happens when we actually make such a system, and it will be very practical. But then once we've built the system, we can look at it again and ask, what is it really doing? What's the system really doing? And we'll see it's just doing regression. So to set the whole thing in context before we get lost in any detail, let's just see the whole chain of events that's going to happen in first building and then in using an HMM-based speech synthesis system. We're going to need a front end, and the front end is going to perhaps be exactly the same front end we used in unit selection or any other time. It's the same, exact same linguistic processor, and it produces the same linguistic features that are available for unit selection. We may use them all. We may use a subset of them. It doesn't matter. So the linguistic processing is exactly the same, and all that really differs is that we flatten the context and attach it to the phone, this phone level. Now, that's kind of happening anyway in unit selection, because in unit selection, we're proceeding phone by phone, or in practice, diphone by diphone, but it's effectively the same thing. We're proceeding through a linear string of units, and for each of them, we calculate a target cost. That target cost might query this rich hierarchical linguistic structure, but it's doing so for each diphone. So it's still pretending that speech is this linear string of context-dependent units, and the context is associated with things at the phone level. They happen to be diphones, but they could be phones. So we're still always doing the flattening thing in unit selection, but we do it explicitly in HMM synthesis. We explicitly rewrite the string of phones as a string of context-dependent phones. Then for each of those classes, this very, very large number of classes, we need a statistical model. So we can store this model, and then when it comes to synthesis time, and we put our new text through the linguistic processor, through the front end, and it tells us the string of context-sensitive phones we need, we have already got a model for each of them. We retrieve it, and we string them together and perform some process to generate speech from that, which will first generate speech features or speech parameters, and then use the vocoder to actually get us a waveform. <clears throat> So all that seems fairly straightforward. Train your models, store them, use them to synthesize. And the core problem is going to be that there are more models than we could ever train from any reasonable data set. And to put that more specifically, at synthesis time, when a new sentence comes in and our front end rewrites it as a sequence of context-dependent phones, there'll be a model in there with a name that we don't have in our set of trained models because it never occurred in the training data. And then we need to know, what are we going to do when we don't have this model? There's only one thing we can do, and that's use one of the models we do have. And this is the moment at which we collapse this infinite set of linguistic contexts down to a finite set of things we've actually modeled and make this assumption that some things are equivalent or nearly equivalent. They sound sufficiently similar. Now, it's obvious we're going to use HMMs because that's the title of this, this uh, class. Um, 
Why HMMs, you may ask? You may well ask. Not the smartest model, not the most sophisticated model. Um, in fact, a very, very simple model. Um, and the answer is we use HMMs because they are a very simple model. And the consequence of them being a very simple model is they've got really nice algorithms. The algorithms are tractable and they're efficient. They converge and they train quickly. So they're very nice models to compute with. We'll see maybe later on there's other more sophisticated sequence models such as linear dynamical models and all sorts of better models. These are less convenient to compute with, although they may be more faithful models of, of the speech signal. We're going to stick with HMMs. HMMs are simple generative models. And an HMM is a finite state machine. And in each of the states of the finite state machine lives a probability density function. It might be a discrete distribution. If we wanted to generate symbols, we're wanting to generate continuous vocoder parameters. So we're going to put continuous density functions in, probability density functions. They're going to be Gaussians because that's most convenient for computation. Anything else is more difficult. And although in speech recognition, it appears that we use HMMs as a classifier, it looks like we turn speech into a sequence of classes, HMMs are not classifiers. An HMM is a generative model. So an HMM can indeed be used to generate, and it can generate a sequence of observations like that. So as an aside, how do you use a generative model to make a classifier? Very simple, you have a generative model of each of your classes, and you see the probability that your observed data was generated by each of your models, and whichever could generate it with the highest probability, you assign that class label. So you can form a classifier from a set of generative models. And that's the standard form of speech recognition in HMMs. Things have moved on since then in ASR. But that's the, the basic form of speech recognition. And we're actually going to use them to generate. We're going to use them as generative models. So the whole process is going to look a little bit like this. Just to keep setting ourselves back in, in the overall context of things, we've got some input text. And in that input text, we've got a sequence of letters. Those letters get turned into phones through either looking up in the lexicon or letter to sound. They get lots of context attached to them by all of the modules in the front end, all those processing modules. And each of those processing modules is effectively attaching features to the phones. And eventually, we're going to find out that the features we're attaching are really just binary features. We can collapse everything down to a large set of binary features, like is it or is it not something? Is it part of speech noun or not? So we're going to eventually effectively treat all of these features as binary features, as ones and zeros, yeses and nos. That's true in HMM synthesis, and it's true in DNN synthesis. We collapse almost all the features down to binary yes or no features. And it's pretty much true in unit selection synthesis because the target cost is effectively revolves around things that match or don't match. And we can only do that just knowing whether they have the same feature or a different feature. So it's effectively collapsing everything to binary. So all of that beautiful linguistic structure that we spent so ages constructing, trees and things, it's flattened down to this rather long sequence of ones and zeros, which will give them probe with questions or users' features in a DNN. In the HMM case then, those features, think of these features now as some large binary number. Um, with a very large number of bits. We'll see uh, tomorrow when we build a DNN voice in the lab, there may be um, 300 such binary features or more. So each of these models has got a name chosen from a set which is a 300-bit binary number. So that's 2 to the 300 possible models. That's quite a lot. I suspect it's more than the number of atoms in the universe. It's a very large number. And so, obviously, we can't model this. But we're going to try, we're going to try and build two to the 300 different models. So that at synthesis time, we'll have every model we could ever need, and we can retrieve it back. We can perform some generation process from these models to generate a sequence of vocoder parameters, and then we can vocode to produce the waveform. So far, so good. Chime in with questions at any point. So it's going to get less and less human readable. I'm not going to draw 300-bit binary numbers. So let's draw them in a slightly more readable, but still horrible form. 
um, because this is what we use in the, in the code, and if we know HDK, we'll be familiar with this. We've taken the front end, we've produced this structured object, we've flattened it onto the phone level, and each of those phones is now a name that encodes its entire linguistic context. So this is, let's pick one, this is the model of or in author, and it's in the context th to the right and silence to the left, er to the right of that and more silence to the left of that, and all of this horrible stuff here is an encoding of all the other context. Um, maybe this one encodes its syllable structure, um, maybe this one here encodes its distance from a prosodic phrase break or something like that. So we've encoded all of this stuff and we could further expand that out just to binary features. Is there a phrase break three words from now or not? Is there a phrase break four words from now or not? It's very naive, linguistically very naive, but very convenient for what, we've, what is to come. So we've now got this very, very large set of categories of classes. And we would like to build a model for every single one of them, this vast. Okay? Now, I did imply earlier that there's an infinite set of such categories because there's an infinite number of sentences in the language. This is true. However, our front end can only extract so many things from a sentence, and it's going to do the same processing for every sentence. So the number of features that we extract is going to be, in fact, finite. So the context is going to be somehow limited. So it's not going to encompass every single word in a sentence because that's a variable length thing. It's going to become a fixed size, but still ridiculously large. So it's not quite infinite, but it's two to the 300, which is practically infinite as far as the data is concerned. So we couldn't possibly have a training example of every one of those units in the data. The context is very, very rich. In fact, it's so rich that if we converted our training data, for example, the database for unit selection, which we might use to train our statistical model, if we rewrote all of the phones with all of their context attached and then did a sort on those and then looked at them, we'd find there's exactly one occurrence of each. Never does the same thing happen twice, only in some weird cases like a special sort of silence or if the same sentence happens to occur twice in the database, like we've got someone saying, okay, twice as a single isolated sentence. So context is so rich, we've got pretty much all the time exactly one training example of the things in the training data, the few tens of thousands of segments in the training data, and exactly no training examples of the billions of other things that are possible. So that's problematic. Not only can we not train models of the things that are not in the training data, we can't train models of the things that are in the training data because there's only one example. And that's not enough to robustly estimate the statistical model. So we need to develop a solution which solves both of those things at the same time. It can create a model for something we never saw. That sounds a bit tricky. And it can robustly estimate a model of things we have seen, but only once. And the solution to both is to pool data such that at some point we've got enough data pooled together, we can train a model. And we use that model for all of the contexts we've pooled together and all the other contexts that have enough in common with that group of contexts. So we're going to do some form of clustering of these models. So this is what we're calling view one. This is the how to build an ASR system converted to how to build a TTS system, which is try and train models, fail, come up with a clever solution, which is called clustering or tying, and we get to train models. So it's going to be parameter sharing, which in the world of speech recognition is usually called tying. In other words, there are two models that each have apparently their own parameter, but they're just pointers to a common underlying parameter, so they're tied together, they're joined. So we can achieve that very straightforwardly by clustering. Effectively, we're going to cluster the data. We're actually gonna train very bad models and cluster the models, but it almost amounts to clustering the data. Those clusters of data, that's like pooling training data, across groups of different contexts, different types, different classes, and that will give us enough data to robustly estimate a model. So we're just doing what we said we have to do all the time, is that we have to make an assumption that this, this sound in this context sounds so much like the sound in this context that in unit selection we can use one if we don't have the other, and in parametric synthesis we can use the same model for both. So that's what we're going to do. 
Now we have to cast your mind back two lectures ago to the lectures on the front end. Remember, looked at classification and regression tree, CART. There are lots of different ways of clustering things. We need a very special way of clustering things here because we don't just want to do bottom-up clustering and form clusters of training data. We need uh, synthesis time to be able to take just the name of a model, which we don't have, and find the right model in the set of models based only on its name. In other words, only on its linguistic context. So given only linguistic context, we have to retrieve a model from the set of models. So we always know the linguistic context because the front end tells us. We know that for the training data and we know for the test data. In the training data, we also know the acoustics, the speech, and therefore we can get a model. It sounds awfully like the sort of problems we saw in the front end. And this is the sort of problem we can train with a classification tree or a regression tree. So we're going to build a regression tree. And the regression tree is going to take as its inputs, its predictors, it's going to take the names of the models. Let's just pretend they're triphones because it's quicker to write triphones and easier to read. So the names of the models are things we always know. So those are the predictors. And the thing we're trying to predict is the model parameter, such as the value of the mean of a Gaussian in, in the third state of the HMM. So those are the pre predictees. So we're just going to build a regression tree that regresses from names of models to parameters of models. And that's it. Very simple. We could try and do it by rule, but of course we're going to learn it from data. So we're going to build a regression tree. It's going to query these linguistic features. And now we can see why all of these linguistic features are effectively going to be treated as if they're binary, because in our regression tree, assume it's a binary tree, we always have to ask yes, no questions. Is it this or not this? And that's just like rewriting the features as binary. So we might have a feature that is the next phone. The next phone can take 40 possible values. But when we query it, we'll, we'll ask questions like, is it a B, yes or no? Is it a D, yes or no? And that could be just equivalent to rewriting the name of the phone as a sort of one of K vector of ones and zeros. We could ask, is it a vowel or not? Well, that's equivalent to rewriting the list of 40 phones as a list of the vowels and list of the not vowels and then having a feature that's one or zero, depending which of those is the case. So we're effectively rewriting the features as binary. We don't explicitly do it in HMMs because we can query symbols and ask pattern matching questions about symbols. In DNNs, we will literally rewrite it as a binary vector because we need those numbers as input to the DNN. But they're being treated exactly the same, very naively. So we've got this regression tree and that given only the name of the current segment we're trying to synthesize, and its surrounding context, we can descend the tree, and at the leaf of the tree, there is a model. The clustering is going to be done state by state for the models. It could be done on whole models, but it tends to be done state by state. And we'll refine this view a little bit later on. Actually, things will be a little bit more sophisticated than this later on. But Press you on. Oh. Yeah. As, you, uh, as you grow this tree, you need to keep track of the entropy of the resulting mixtures or something like that. What, what are you measuring the entropy of? Oh, okay, so the question is about um, how you build this tree. Um, so you need to read the PhD thesis of Odell, who basically came up with this for HMMs, for speech recognition. It's not going to be entropy because these things, these things down here are continuous valued things. They're not symbols anymore. So we're going to measure something else. What we would like to measure, so this is a, a generative model of data, and so how do we measure how good a generative model is of some data? We'll measure the likelihood that it generated that data. And what does it mean to train a model on the data? Well, it means to find its values of its parameters, and the normal criterion would be to maximize the likelihood of the training data. So we do maximum likelihood training, ML, maximum likelihood training. So what we would genuinely really like to measure when we're growing this tree, well, let's, let's just make it really clear what happens as we grow this tree. What does it mean to be at the root of the tree? It means to have just one model for all contexts. Let's imagine we do this per phone class, or maybe for all phone classes. Being at the root is saying there's one model and you should use it all the time, regardless of context. To go down the tree is to say, we'll have two models, and in the case where there's a vowel to the right, we'll use this model, otherwise we use this other model. 
And that's what that means. And we would, need to, we would like to measure them when we're building the tree. How much better is it to have two models instead of one model? Does it, how much better does it get? And the obvious thing we should measure will be the likelihood of the training data. This will always increase the likelihood of the training data. You've got a model with more parameters fitted to the data. Unless you've done something horribly wrong, it will increase the likelihood of the training data. And as long as it increases it enough, <coughs> we'll take this. And this, measure, this increasing likelihood will be the criteria for choosing the question. And it might also be eventually the criteria for stopping if we can't increase it by enough anymore. To measure the actual likelihood of the training data would involve actually training these two models <coughs> and then going through all the training data and computing its likelihood for every possible question we could put here. That's actually way too expensive. So if you read Odell's thesis, we can actually approximate this very, very well by just storing certain statistics of the training data. And the only assumption we make is that the alignment between the models and the data doesn't change as we make the, the model set more sophisticated. It's very beautifully explained in the thesis. It's actually quite straightforward. So we're going to measure increase in likelihood of training data. We're going to approximate that with a very good approximation. In speech synthesis, the trees tend to get much larger, especially for parameters like F0, because there's very few parameters at each leaf, so very, very deep trees. And it becomes more important to more carefully control the size of the tree. And somebody asked a question, I think, when we were talking about cart. There are different stopping criteria available. The naive one is just to put a threshold on the increase in likelihood, and if it's not big enough, stop. We might also use some information theoretic measure like minimum description length to control the depth of the tree. We don't need to understand all those details to understand the concepts, though. So there's a picture borrowed from the HTK manual. So HTK is just standard toolkit for speech recognition, which is extended for speech synthesis. And let's see if we can understand the whole picture. Ignore the phone set. I don't know what phone set this is. This is a speech recognition person's idea of a phone set, I think. In speech recognition, we use triphone models. So in speech synthesis, we're going to use quinphone plus all that other stuff. But the concept's exactly the same. In speech recognition, we'll typically take all the models of the same center phone. So these are all the models of ah, whatever sound that is. And we cluster differently for each state position. So we're going to have one tree that is spe specifically for clustering the center state of all of the triphones of ah. So there'll be three trees for this phone, and then there'll be three more trees for every one of the other 40-odd phones in the language. And we just query the name. So we ask, is it voice to the left, silence to the right, and so on. And at the leaves of the tree are groups of contexts that have this much in common, but we don't know anything about the things we didn't ask. So... This maps directly on what we were talking about at the beginning. Some aspects of the linguistic context make a difference to the current sound, so we should ask about them, and we should try and match them. Some aspects of the current context appear not to make a difference to the current sound. In other words, in the training data, we didn't find enough evidence that this made a big difference to the sound, and so it wasn't worth querying them. In other words, when we built the regression tree, at some point we tried asking about that context feature, we tried partitioning the data, and it didn't increase the likelihood very much, or as much as some other question. So there was not much acoustic difference between this, these split. So it wasn't very predictive of the acoustics. So that question didn't find its way into the tree. So this is how we discover automatically that some contexts, and there's some features in the context, don't have much effect on the acoustics, and we don't need to ask about them. And that's good news, because that lets us have multiple contexts at the leaves of this tree. Now, I'm not going to go into huge detail about the mechanics of, of training this. Let's just sort of verbally summarize how the recipe would go. To cluster the models, you need some models. Where did these models come from? Well, in the training data, we do have one training example of some models. So we train a model on that one training example. It's a rather badly trained model. But it'll be different to a model trained on some other context. So it'll be enough information to know which ones turned out somewhat similar and how to cluster them. So we will cluster based on rather badly trained models. Once we get to this point, we'll make the model share the parameters, and then we'll retrain them. And in this retraining, they'll have a lot more data available because they've pooled all their data together, and we'll get much better models. Okay? <clears throat>
The clustering is based on rather badly trained models, and then we train better models after that. In the really fancy HMM synthesis recipes, we then repeat this several times so we can get some slightly better models to recluster them, and we can go round and round and round. And this is when the recipe starts to take a week to run on your big computer instead of a day. But that's just a refinement. It's not important to understand that. So we each thing measure the increasing likelihood to get the best split. <clears throat> and how do we get models for unseen contexts? Well, hopefully it's completely obvious. Imagine we wanted a model of A ah, in this context that we've never seen before. At synthesis time, we've, someone's typed a sentence in. We want to say something that involves needing this model. We don't have it in the, anywhere in the training data. It doesn't matter because you just descend the tree, find out which leaf you go to, and use the model that you find there. And we're saying that this is equivalent to whatever we found all down here. So that's trivial. At runtime, that's going to be super fast. It's going to be no problem doing that. The compute is going to be in building the tree, which is the training process. That's offline. Any questions about that conventional view, this view of attempting to train models you can't really train, and then finding this nice solution of sharing their parameters? OK. Now we've got this system. It's tempting to think of this as hidden Markov models doing lots of work. They're state machines. They've got Gaussians in. What's, what's really happening is hidden Markov models, nice sequence models. And then this is, there's this unfortunate kind of bit of mechanism in the background that provides the models with their parameters. It's just sort of hidden. It's inconvenient. We wish we could train separate models for everything. We can't. So there's this kind of messy tree thing which when the model says, give me a Gaussian, it happens to get the same Gaussian as some other model, but there's this hidden mechanism. That would be a, a, a one view of it. That would be the mechanistic, how did we build it view, but it's not really what's going on. What's really going on is that we've got a big tree that is making predictions from names of models to parameters of Gaussian distributions. That's regression. That's all the work of speech synthesis. Everything is happening in the regression tree. All the HMMs do is tell us what order to do things in. They tell us to go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. They're just a timekeeper, a sequence, a sequence thing. Not really doing very much more than that. So the second view then, the view that is easiest to connect back to unit selection and to connect forwards onto DNN synthesis, is that this is speech synthesis based on a regression tree. So we've got a big box that's doing all the work in the chain of events from text eventually to speech or to speech parameters to drive a vocoder. And it's all about regressing from linguistic context features, flattened onto the phone, and then expanded out to this big sparse binary vector of 300 or 400 bits. And we're just querying individual bits of this vector. And in arriving at any leaf in the tree, we're just querying a very few bits. Think about how deep this tree is compared to the number of questions we could ask. <clears throat> the whole point is we don't query all the features. The point is we query the small subset of features that are predictive of the acoustics, and we don't even look at the values of the other features. So we just go down a few questions. So the depth of the tree is going to be order of 10 maybe order of 100 in F0, but it's not going to be hundreds and hundreds. It's not going to be all 300 questions we could have asked. So we just ask a small subset of questions in a specific order and end up with a prediction of an acoustic parameter. Now, there's going to be a distribution from which we still need to generate, but effectively, we've already got speech parameters now here at the leaves of this tree. So it's almost a lookup table. It's a kind of fancy lookup table. So I think we'll take a break in a minute. But we'll just leave, leave you with some thoughts to think about in the break to help us connect when we come back. We've queried the linguistic context, which is extremely rich, and we've made a prediction of an acoustic value, a set of vocoder parameters. But hopefully it's immediately obvious that depending what acoustic parameter we're predicting, imagine F0 compared to the spectral envelope, we might want to ask 
about very different linguistic features in a very different order. If we're predicting the spectral envelope, we probably first want to know what phone we're in. That's pretty much crucial. In fact, probably want to know whether it's silence or speech first, and then we would like to know if it's speech, which phoneme it is, and then what's to the left and right phonetically, and then eventually we might ask something about syllable structure or something like that. If we're predicting the value of F0, we might not care what the current phone is. We might first want to query, are we in a stressed syllable? That might be the biggest acoustic difference. The first split, the first partition of the training data might be into things that have high F0 and things that have low F0. So we might want to ask different questions in a different order. So hopefully it's obvious then that we couldn't just use the same regression tree to do the regression onto the spectral envelope as to regress onto F0. We might want to have separate regression models for that. That's not going to be problematic at all. That's going to turn out to be dead easy. It sounds like it might be really messy and horrible, but it's not going to be. We're going to just have separate regression trees. We'll see that after the break. But I'll leave you with a question. If we have some intuition about which features are most predictive for which of these different acoustic parameters, should we use our knowledge to sort of pre-select those features? Should we, should we decide that for F0, we're only going to consider this about the linguistic context? And for spectral envelope, we're only going to consider that and then build our regression trees. So that's a question for you to ponder in the break. So I think I've been assuming a little bit of background in the basics of speech recognition and HMMs, because we can't cover all of the background before getting into things here. If you're missing that, if you don't know some of this stuff, there are, there's lots of basic material on the Speech Zone website. Um, that's not all complete yet, but it'll be complete in the next month or so. So I left you with this question. <clears throat> we're clustering our HMMs. In, in other words, we're building a regression tree. And we've decided that we can't use the same regression tree for all of the different acoustic parameters of the vocoder because different contextual factors will have a much bigger influence on some than on others. So we want to ask different questions in a different order. And we pondered whether we should then engineer that. We should decide which features to use for each stream, as they're called. <clears throat> so let's think about that. So let's just clarify some terminology. <coughs> Excuse me. There's some terminology. So our vocoder, depending on the vocoder, it might have different parameters. But broadly speaking, we're going to have something to do with the spectral envelope of the voiced part, um, the F0, the energy, and something maybe about the aperiodic, non-periodic energy, maybe the spectral envelope of that as well. And we could divide each of those quite different acoustic types of features into what are called streams, and that will become clear in a moment. So we, we're going to build a different regression tree to predict each stream of vocoder features. And of course, yes, we could engineer, we could decide which features to use, but the regression tree will learn that for us. That's the point of classification and regression trees. As we already saw in the front end, we just think of every possible feature, and we've thought of 300 binary features we could use from the front end, and we just provide all of them to the algorithm that builds the tree, the greedy algorithm. And it will select the ones which partition the training data. In other words, which cluster the models most effectively. So there's no need to pre-select those features for each stream. Given enough data, and as long as we don't overcluster and go too deep down the tree, we'll automatically discover which features are the most useful. We don't need to do pre-selection unless we've got really strong engineering intuitions about excluding features because they'll cause problems, but that shouldn't happen. So assuming a little bit of background with the basics of speech recognition using HMMs and uh, TRIFO models, let's just clarify some of the important differences between what we're doing here in HMM synthesis and what we do in HMM speech recognition. The most obvious one is that we're considering a much richer context when building our acoustic models. Why? Why is that? Why does, does speech recognition use this very rich linguistic context? Surely it'd be better to take more context features into account. Well, you, you indeed might find systems that use quinphones instead of triphones, and you might get some small improvement by doing that. But the goals are quite different of recognition and of synthesis. Although we might appear to be using the same models, we're doing quite different things with them. In recognition, we're trying to draw boundaries between categories. And to draw a boundary between categories, 
we want to use the simplest model we can so that it's as robust as possible, it's as well trained on the data as possible. And if a triphone model can draw the boundary, there's no reason to move to a quinphone model. If it's got more parameters, it might be less well trained and actually could do worse. In synthesis, we don't care where the boundaries between categories are, we care where the middles of the categories are in acoustic space, because we would like to generate these sounds from the canonical, the middle, the prototypical sound. So when we've got a model of an R in a certain context and we generate from it, we want it to sound like R. We don't care where the boundary between that sound is and OO. So in ASR then we want the simplest possible models that can draw boundaries between categories and ultimately those categories are words. So we just need to disambiguate the phoneme sufficiently so that we can then decode the words with the simplest possible model. In other words, with the fewest parameters so we can train it the best on the available data. Synthesis, that's not the case. We just want to know where the middles of models are, where the peaks of these Gaussians are. Because as we'll see in the generation algorithm, that's really what we're going to use when we generate is the modes of these statistical distributions, not the boundaries between them. So that explains why we really want these full context models, because we want to be very specific about what it is to sound R in a certain context. Where's the average? Where's the middle of that sound? And the second obvious difference is that the observation vector, in other words, the thing that we're modeling, the thing that is emitted or generated by our generative model, in the case of ASR, again, only needs to discriminate between sounds. So it just needs to be the least possible set of features in some sense that helps us tell the difference between sounds. In synthesis, we actually need to reconstruct the waveform. So it needs to be as rich as possible to give us the best reconstruction of the waveform possible. In all cases, we're going to trade off against the richness, the dimensionality of that, and the number of parameters in the model and the amount of data. So we need to keep things controlled for that reason. So I think we now have to look at this picture because it appears in a lot of papers on HMM synthesis, being copied many times. It's not obvious <laughs> who it belongs to anymore. Um, I've copied it from this paper, <laughs> but I'm sure they copied it from some other papers. This is the complete flow chart. So again, the procedural view of how you make and use an HMM system. It doesn't tell you really how it works. It just tells you how things go when you sit down and try and build such a thing. You start with your speech database and you parameterize that using your vocoder. So your vocoder has got two parts. It's got a part that encodes the waveform into parameters and a part that decodes it back into the waveform. So you use the encoder part and you encode into whatever features your vocoder uses. You might not use the raw vocoder features, you might need to do some transformations to them to make them suitable for modeling with Gaussian distributions. So you might need to do some feature engineering to make them have the right statistical properties, such as assuming independence between the parameters within the vectors. So you might do, for example, Kepstrel expansions of the spectral envelope to make these statistical properties more true. You've got your parameterized speech then, and then you train your model. That's what you store. So you've got this stored model. This is a picture of some separate HMMs. This isn't a very helpful way of thinking about what the stored model is. What the stored model is is some really big regression trees. That's really what's in the stored model. And then that tells us what parameters to use when we synthesize from. So in the training part then, training our HMM synthesizer, the big part of computation isn't doing the bound welsh algorithm, the forward-backward to effectively align the data with the model and then to estimate the Gaussians. That's quite fast. The big part of the computation is building the regression trees, especially if we rebuild and rebuild them. But even just building them once is computationally expensive because they're big and there's a very large set of questions. So every possible split in the tree, we've got to try at the root all 300 questions. And then at the next level down, the remaining 299 questions, and then 298 questions. And that multiplies up going through the tree. So there's a very, very large number of trials of splits we have to make when we're building the tree. We store the model, and then we can use that to generate. And we're going to see in a moment how we do that. The model generates back into vocoder parameter space, so it generates the same sort of features it was trained on, of course. And then we need to use the remainder of our vocoder to actually generate a waveform. And text-to-speech, then, is just a question of 
putting text through the front end to convert it into a sequence of names of models, sometimes called labels. And then we're just going to go and retrieve those models from the stored set of models, sequence them together, in other words, concatenate them, and then generate from this concatenated model our sentence. So let's just say a little bit more then about the fact that our vocoder parameters are also heterogeneous. They're in different categories. F0 is quite a different thing to spectral envelope, and it will be predicted with different linguistic features. And how do we achieve that? So we can break the vocoder parameters down into these things called streams, and the streams are stacked together to make a big observation vector for our HMMs. So that might look a little bit like this. Here's one version of that. This is a little bit simplified. This is an observation vector. So we've got an HMM state, and inside the HMM state is a Gaussian distribution. I'll draw a univariate Gaussian, but it's going to be a high dimension Gaussian of the same dimension as the observation vector we're going to generate. It might be quite a big number. It might be 60, it might be 100 quite a large number. And the observation vector is broken down into streams. I need to spell out now what's in these different streams. So one part is going to be the spectrum. This might be represented using something like Kepstrel coefficients as a statistically decorrelated version of the full spectral envelope. Another part might be to do with the excitation. The simplest possible case would be the value for F0. And we might have a flag that tells us whether it is an F0 or not. We could encode that as a zero value for F0. Or we could do something really messy, which we'll see in a minute, which is to have no value for F0 in the voice and voice parts. What's not shown here is the non-periodic energy. So we might add additional parameters of that. And exactly how this is structured depends on your vocoder. It depends what parameters you need in your vocoder. So that's the streams. And we can see something else here that's going to have to be made clear in a minute. In this observation vector, we don't just store the basic Kepstrel coefficients of the spectral envelope, this thing here, that might have, let's say, 40 coefficients, rather more than the 12 for speech recognition. We're going to store its deltas, in other words, its velocities. Is it increasing or decreasing compared to previous and next frames? And we're going to store accelerations, in other words, the velocity of the velocity. Is it getting faster and faster, or is it slowing down? And we'll see why we need those in a moment. In speech recognition, we also use those because they're discriminative. They help us tell the difference between classes. Here, they're going to help us more faithfully generate the trajectories that we need. So those are the things divided into streams. And we're going to have separate trees now for each of these streams. And the fact that all of the deltas and delta deltas for the spectrum can be collapsed into one stream, whereas the ones for F0 somehow stay in their own streams, is a bit mysterious just here, but will come a bit clearer in a moment or two. But the output vectors, uh, observation vectors... Pressure, your, press your thing. Yeah. Yeah. People at the back can hear you. The, the observation vectors should be um, uh, vocoder parameters at the end of the day, right? So let's just clarify where the vocoder parameters are in here. So these, this is the the capsule representation of the spectrum so that our vocoder will So you may need. choose to do that, yeah. Yep. Um, we could have chosen to store something, some other representation of the spectrum. The Kepstrom is convenient because it's decorrelated and suitable for modeling with a diagonal covariance Gaussian. So that's, that's some vocoder parameters. These are not needed by the vocoder. They're going to be used as part of generation, which we'll see in a minute, these deltas and delta deltas. Likewise, let's assume this value here is just exactly F0. That's needed by the vocoder. The vocoder doesn't need to know the the deltas of F0, but we do need them for generation. Again, as we'll come clear in a minute. So the vocoder parameters are indeed in there in the observation vector, along with some extra stuff to help us with generation. Now, when we use a vocoder, hopefully it's obvious, but it's worth stating that the number of parameters that we need for the vocoder needs to be fixed in each frame. It can't vary from frame to frame, because then the dimensionality of our Gaussians would vary from frame to frame, and then I've no idea how to cluster them with a regression tree. That's a, a nightmare. There's no sensible machine learning to do that. So if we have a vocoder, for example, if our, if our vocoder parameters 
where the amplitudes of the individual sinusoids in a sinusoidal model, and the number of those sinusoids varied because F0 is varying and with the number of harmonics might vary, we can't directly model that. We would need to make that somehow a fixed number of, of parameters. So a vocoder has to have a fixed dimensionality. There are various different ways of doing that. One would be just to fix the number of sinusoids. Another way that's more common would be actually model the envelope as the Kepstrom. So to effectively do the same sort of thing as any other vocoder. So these sinusoidal models are, give very, very high quality. But in their kind of raw, naked form, they're not so convenient for directly modeling. We need to do some feature engineering to make them have features which we can model. That's fine for the spectral envelope. We all can have a fixed dimensionality that represents the spectral envelope. In other words, the, the form and structure of the speech. But there's a parameter in speech which is really annoying because it doesn't always exist, and that's the fundamental frequency. And that's because the vocal folds sometimes vibrate and sometimes don't vibrate. It's very, very inconvenient in statistical modeling to have a parameter that sometimes doesn't exist. How can we train a model of it, and what do we do at generation time? There are lots and lots of different solutions to this. One would be to give F0 a magic special value when it doesn't exist. And the typical value would be zero. So if we draw, this is time, and this is frequency. If we draw an F0 plot, it's going to have value sometimes, but other times it's not going to have values. We could give it a special zero value, and we could effectively redraw F0 like this. That's one possibility. And then ask our model to model that. But that's kind of weird. Because at this moment in time, the model has to predict that F0 suddenly plunges all the way to zero and then stays there at exactly zero for a while and then suddenly goes right back up. Because this zero value is a fake value. It doesn't exist. It's not really F0 at all. It's just a dummy. It's a flag. So that's going to be a bit of a mess for statistical modeling. Another solution which is used, which is much more sensible, is just to interpolate a value of F0 across this gap here. So to fill in the blanks and ask the model to effectively model F0 when it doesn't exist by giving it interpolated values for the training data. And at generation time, we could generate these interpolated values plus a flag that says, actually, it's unvoiced. So we're just interpolating at the moment and then voicing comes back on again. That would be a sensible and, and good solution. It's actually not the most common solution. The most common solution is rather more mind bending. Um, and I know people that don't believe that this is statistically possible. I'm just going to tell you how it's done without telling you if I believe it or not. This is how it's done. We say that F0 is a vector of dimension 1. Yeah, it's a number, scalar, which is also a vector of one dimension. I'm happy with the fact that a scalar is a one-dimensional vector? That's not too difficult, right? That's not the mind-bending part. When F0 doesn't exist, it's a vector of zero dimension. I don't know how you draw that. Okay, so F0 has varying dimensionality. Now, I said before, that's statistically very inconvenient. Indeed, it is. But it's the standard solution in the standard toolkit in HTS that does that. And so how do we model something that's sometimes one-dimensional and something zero-dimensional? We effectively model it with a mixture distribution, a mixture of two densities. One of them is a one-dimensional Gaussian. This is fine. I can understand that. And the other is a zero-dimensional Gaussian. So it's got no parameters because it doesn't have a value. It doesn't have a mean or a variance. It's, it's, it's empty. It's a blank space. So that's okay. You can train that. <laughs> and of course, it's because it's a mixture distribution. We have weights. We have mixture weights on the two distributions. And the mixture weights tell us if we're in the voiced or the unvoiced thing. So there's some mixture weights. And so this R1 means we're in one-dimensional vector space of real numbers. This is zero-dimensional space. And we have some weight that tells us which of these is more likely, and effectively that's the voicing probability. And this is called a multi-space distribution, because it's in two different spaces, two different vector spaces, a one-dimensional space and a no-dimensional space. And that's how it's done. So effectively, really what we're doing is having a flag for voicing, which is the mixture weight, and if the mixture weight for voicing is higher, then we have a distribution for voicing. If we're doing that, and it is indeed what we do as standard, when we generate from the model, we'll see, we'll see the generation algorithm in a minute, but in generation, we're going to take a walk through the HMM, 
let's assume it looks like this for now. We're going to take a walk through the HMM and generate some observation. And then maybe we'll make a transition to the next state and generate an observation. It's possible that in moving from one state to the other, we might move from unvoiced to voiced. That's very likely to happen between if these, if these states were in adjacent models, different models. It might happen within a certain sound. So the dimensionality of this, of this bit of the vector can, can change from frame to frame. So it can come and go from frame to frame. And that's going to be a little messy in a minute. But let's talk about the remaining parameter that we haven't talked about at all that's not a vocoder parameter, but it is a parameter we always have to model, and that's the duration. So we need to model how long speech sounds last. In a normal HMM, that's what this thing here does, this self-transition probability. And the self-transition probability would normally be a number that's close to, but a bit less than one, such as 0.9. And that's the probability of going round and round and round and round and eventually leaving. So that's the model of duration that's used in ASR. If we think about what the duration distribution looks like, we can do that with all done our pocket calculator, take 0.9 and just multiply it by itself over and over again. It's going to be this exponentially decaying distribution like that. If we plot the real duration distribution of speech sounds, it doesn't look like that. It might look a bit more like this sort of kind of skewed Gaussian sort of distribution. So this self-transition probability is a very weak model of, of duration because it doesn't look the same shape. It's got a much more fundamental problem though. We're using generative models, hidden Markov models, and we're going to have to generate in a minute, and we need to generate under some sound statistical principle. And the obvious one to do is to use maximum likelihood because that's what we used in training. And we should just do the most likely thing at generation time. Here's a model of some speech sound. Let's use it to generate. What should we do? Well, we'll just generate the most likely thing of this model. This would make the most likely duration of everything one frame. We just fly straight through the model at maximum speed. Because the longer you stay in the model, the less probable things get. That's a really rubbish model of duration. That wouldn't work at all. So we're going to actually use a proper parametric model of duration in speech synthesis. So we're going to fit, for example, a Gaussian to this or to the log of this. We're going to have just another parametric model of duration. There's some implications of that that I'm actually going to skip over and refer you to readings for. It's mathematically a bit challenging to have explicit models of duration. It's fine at at generation time, if you're just doing maximum likelihood and picking the mode of this distribution, it, it makes it very difficult to do decoding, which is why we'll very rarely see that kind of model in speech recognition. It makes Viterbi decoding impossible, essentially. So for synthesis, we might train with a transition model and then after the fact fit our special parametric duration model and only use it for generation. Or we might get very clever and try and actually train with this full parametric duration model, which is probably unnecessary. And of course the duration models, because they're just parametric, they're Gaussians, you can just cluster those with a regression tree just like all the other parameters. And so in other words, duration is also a regression problem. We predict the duration by regressing on the linguistic features. So it's actually no different to any of the other parameters really in the way it's treated. It's just a generation time will use the duration to decide how many frames to generate, not what goes in each of the frames. But in terms of learning it, it's not any different from anything else. All right, so let's just summarize this, this little bit. We've talked quite at length now about the different streams and the clustering and so on. So the full model actually looks a little bit like this. We've got some Kepstrom or some other representation of the spectrum. It's almost certainly going to be on a perceptual scale if we're sensible. And we're going to have a regression model that predicts its value, a tree. We're also going to have some source parameters such as F0. We might actually take the log of it to make it look a bit more Gaussian. Because F0 is a bit funny, it's a one-sided thing, it's never negative. So we might make it look more Gaussian in its distribution by taking log or some other function. And we've got regression trees to predict that. If our vocoder also has special parameters for non-periodic energy, so for the difference between s and sh, some aperiodic parameters, we'll have another stream for those. And somewhere else in the model, 
there is a model of duration, which is just another regression tree. So we've just got lots and lots of regression trees. Exactly how we configure them is up to us. It's a design decision. In ASR, we might have one regression tree per monophone, per center phone, per state. In synthesis, we might actually cluster all of the phones together because, for example, in F0, we might not care very much about the center phone until we've asked lots of other questions. So we might have just one regression tree per state position. So one tree for the first emitting state, second emitting state, and third emitting state. This picture's got three emitting states, but it's actually much more com common to have five emitting states. So five emitting state HMMs is the standard for HMM synthesis. So how finally then, given these models, these things we're calling HMMs, but are really lots of regression trees telling us the parameters of some HMMs, how do we actually generate from that? And to remind you, we're going to look at this conceptually rather than mathematically. If you want the mathematical formulations, go to the papers. I think pictures are much easier to understand. So we're going to generate all of the vocoder parameters, and then we're going to drive the vocoder. So we're going to generate from a model. The model is a model of a phone in a particular context, concatenated, sequenced together with all of the other phones in context that make up the whole sentence, as predicted by the front end. And just to make super, super clear, in case it's not obvious, it's completely trivial to concatenate two HMMs together. Let's draw two HMMs. Here's one. I'll just draw some simple ones with self-transitions. Here's an HMM, and here's another HMM. Badly drawn. And if we just join these two things together, this is just an HMM. The beauty of HMMs, they're so simple that we can make one HMM by just gluing two other ones together, by sequencing them, concatenating them. And any algorithm that we know for this one works for the whole one. So we're going to generate for an HMM which has been made by joining together all the phone-sized HMMs. But it's just a really long, stringy HMM with lots and lots of states. So if I draw pictures of little HMMs generating, everything we know there extends to really long HMMs generating. They're not different in any way except for having more states. So if we want to generate, we need some principle, and we've already said that in the absence of any other uh, principle, we'll always go for maximum likelihood. That's the most basic principle of machine learning. Do the most likely thing. Get a model which generates the data with maximum likelihood. Given a model, generate its most likely observations. If we did that, if we generated from an HMM, and we went into an HMM state and said to the state, emit an observation, please, and emit the most likely observation. What's the most likely observation we can emit from an HMM state? Just the mean of the Gaussian. And then we go to the next frame, and let's say we're staying in the same HMM state. Our duration model says we need to do several frames in a row from this HMM state. Let's generate again from the HMM state. What do we generate the next time? The mean again. So we're just going to generate the same exact same value again and again and again for a sequence of frames until the duration model tells us to move to the next state. So if we drew such a thing, let's just draw it for F0 because it's easier to draw things in one dimension. So that's F0 in hertz. We're going to generate a con constant value for some number of frames and then move change state and probably change a different value and then some different value. Have you ever seen an F0 contour that looks like that? except when you generate wrong from an HMM. F0 doesn't look like that. F0 is smooth, and so are all the other acoustic parameters. So we've missed a trick. We've done something wrong. The maximum likelihood generation algorithm there seems to have failed us. There's nothing wrong with the principle. It's just that we haven't modeled something properly, and now we need to think what we need to model to get that smooth trajectory. So we're going to sequence from this model. We're going to visit the states in order, and at each time frame, the time frames are typically going to be a five millisecond step, a 200 frame rate, 200 hertz frame rate. We're just going to generate little bits of speech features. Let's imagine there's a bit of spectrogram 
but in reality, of course, they're vocoder features. And then we move on and we generate the next one and the next one and so on. Okay? And we keep sequencing through, emitting from this model over and over again, and eventually kind of print out a set of vocoder parameters for which we can then use to get the waveform. Now, these vocoder parameters are smoothly varying. We don't see sudden discontinuities in here. Yep. So, as we move through this spectrogram here, things are all nicely smoothly changing. And our waveform is also continuously changing. We see boundaries between some sounds, but they're smooth, they're smooth transitions. And within vowels, for example, we get nice smooth trajectories. So how are we going to get a model that has got discrete states in which we stay for a fixed number of frames, a fixed period of time, and then suddenly move to the next state? How are we going to get such a very discrete kind of a model to generate something smooth and continuous? And the answer is we better look again at the data and think there's something about the data we haven't quite captured in its parameterization, in the vocoder parameterization. So at the moment, we're just thinking about generating the mean of these Gaussians. And that's going to be this piecewise constant thing that we just drew, this kind of square wave. And we don't want to generate that. We want to instead generate something that's smoothly varying. So we're going to kind of join those dots up, it's like a dot to, dot to dot drawing. And we want to draw a smooth trajectory through those dots. If we just follow the mean, we'll get these very nasty squared looking trajectories like that. And that's the wrong solution. That will sound terrible. The solution we do want is to have a nice smooth line Perhaps something like that. So how are we going to do that? Well, a couple of observations we can make about that. First of all, although this is the mean, maybe this is the mean of F0 in the beginning of a certain sound in a certain context, we know more than just the mean. We already know that there's some standard deviation about that mean that we observed in the data. So just generate the mean over and over again is very naive, there's natural variation about that mean. That's one factor, but a more important factor is that we have to get from here to here in some natural and plausible way, and we can only move F0 at a certain velocity. Do uh, you know how to control F0 with your vocal folds? What do you do? How do you change the pitch of your vocal folds? So we do it with tension, there's a muscle, we stretch it, just like a guitar string. So there's a muscle, and that muscle is only so strong and can only act so quickly, it's governed by physics. And so we can only move at a certain velocity between here and here. And we can only change that velocity in, uh, within limits as well, so it's got certain acceleration constraints. The, the, everything has a mass. So that's why we need to model the velocity and the acceleration of this parameter, not just its value. And that's what indeed what we're going to do. So let's just stick with the velocity and then just generalize that to acceleration. So we've got some coefficient, maybe it's one of the Kepster coefficients, maybe it's F0. And in the model, it has this Gaussian distribution. So that's my picture of a Gaussian. And let's see what happens if you try and generate from that. Right? So let's draw that on a time axis like this. Put some, always label your axes. So this is time, and this is going to be a generated parameter coming out of the model eventually will go into the vocoder. Think of it as a formant or F0 or anything that, anything that helps you understand. So I've drawn the Gaussian aligned with the axis of the parameter it's a distribution of. And of course it's got a mean and if we just generate it from that mean, so the frames go through time like this, that's the clock ticking away. And so if we generate it over and over again from the mean, we just generate this piecewise constant value, which would be unnatural. So that's obviously the wrong thing to do. What instead we're going to do is we're going to model not just the distribution of the value we're generating, but the distribution of its velocity. So velocity is speed, but it includes direction because it can go down as well as up. So we're still going to take the distribution over the parameter itself. And we're still going to use that to generate from. But we're also going to generate something that's not only likely under this Gaussian, but is also likely under the other Gaussian. So it's the most likely thing, given what we know about its average value and about its speed. So imagine we know its average value is this, but we know that its speed is positive. 
Generating this is actually quite unlikely because that's got a zero velocity. So in the distribution for velocity, that'll have a very low probability. That's a very unlikely thing for this model to do. We've got some distribution over velocity that says the most likely velocity is plus six. And so the most likely thing we would generate would actually be this. This still has the same average, so it's centered on the mean, but it's got the velocity equal to the mean of the velocity distribution. And hopefully you can mentally generalize that, that if we had a distribution over acceleration, we could say not only would it have this average value, and in general it would be increasing, but it would be getting faster all the time, or it would be slowing down. So acceleration would give us curvature. So we've got value, slope, and curvature. And that's what those three coefficients are going to give us. That's why we need to model them. Once we've done the generation, we only care about the actual value. That's what's going to drive the vocoder. Those deltas are just thrown away. We, don't, we can generate them, but we don't care about their values. There are constraints on generating the base coefficient, this C. And the terminology that's usually used for that is the static, which is a st stupid terminology for it because they're not static at all. They're called the statics to differentiate them from the deltas and the delta deltas. So here's another picture borrowed from a paper, unattributed, because it's borrowed from a paper that's borrowed from a paper, and I don't know how far back to go to attribute it. This is a picture of the whole generation process. And let's just suppose this is now the second Kepstor coefficient of the spectral envelope, or any other parameter that you like to imagine. And this is time in frames. Here's a model at the top. For some reason, this model has got variable numbers of states for silence and for speech sounds. It's showing self-transitions instead of duration distributions. None of that matters. We're going to visit the first state. We're going to stay in it for some period of time, this period of time. And from that state, we're going to generate the first few frames, the first eight frames, let's say. That state has a mean for this coefficient, and it also has a standard deviation, and a mean and standard deviation for velocity, and a mean and standard deviation for acceleration. That's what these gray bands show us. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a trajectory in this base coefficient space that's the most likely trajectory given the distributions over its own value. So it's going to go quite near the mean quite a lot of the time because that's a very likely thing to do. But also as likely as possible given what we know about its velocity and has the curvature that we've also learned from the data. So if we zoomed in a little bit, let's, let's look at this little bit of the picture here. Hopefully this is big enough to see. Here's a little bit of trajectory where the distribution we've learned from the training data, in other words, the statistics, the mean and standard deviation, are so. And we've learned that the velocity is positive. So when we generate from this state, we generate something that's around the mean value, but I'm hoping you can see that, but the trajectory is increasing. And that's likely because this has a mean that's a positive value. And if we zoomed in further, we could see it had some curvature, and its curvature was, it was slowing down slightly because there's slightly negative acceleration. Um, so does that mean that through this special kind of trajectory generation that you do eventually use the standard deviations for the Gaussians, or in fact, does it just keep the means and interpolate yep, so, through Yeah, so uh, good question. Um, we, of course, do use the, the standard deviations, store them as, as variances, but standard deviations are the thing we plot. Um, yes, we do indeed, so let's, let's have a look at some cases. So let's compare the difference between what we're generating here and what we're generating here. So the gray bars are showing you the standard deviations. So the wider they are, the bigger and flatter this Gaussian is. In other words, we can deviate more from the mean while staying reasonably likely. So indeed, the wider the standard deviation, the more we deviate from the mean. And when we have something like this with a very narrow standard deviation, what does that mean? That means in the training data, all of the training examples that were used to train this Gaussian had really similar values to each other. The natural standard deviation of the data was very small, and therefore the Gaussian had a small standard deviation. 
It's saying that this sound is, always sounds really similar. And so when we generate from that, indeed, we'll vary very, only very slightly away from the mean. And take some other sound, like this sound here, in the data that this tape was trained on, there was observed greater variability in the data. So the Gaussian ended up with a larger standard deviation, a higher variance. And so when we generate from it, it's, we can deviate further from the mean while staying likely. So indeed. So if all of these Gaussians had very tight variances, we'd slowly get back to that square wave. It would lock us back onto the trajectories because that would be the most likely thing to do. So indeed, we do need those variances. They tell us how sloppy we can be or how accurate we need to be. But you only have variances for the static parameter. No, we have variances for everything. So for delta and delta yeah, delta. So well. we've okay. found this, this is the most likely trajectory under the, all of these distributions. So if the velocity distribution is negative and has a very tight variance, we better make sure that we're decreasing in value while we're generating from that state. Whereas if the, if the velocity distribution is negative but has a really wide variance, it's not as important to be decreasing. We can still be quite likely. Okay? So I think these are kind of constraints. Now, what's really going on? If we generated in the naive way, we generate this kind of square wave. Yep. Yeah? That's going to sound unnatural. And in nature, in real data, what we see is a smooth curve. Now, there's other ways of smoothing. There are much easier ways of smoothing than doing this. We could just run any simple moving average over it or some, any simple smoothing algorithm we liked and smooth out the bumps. Yep. So we could take things that look like this and run whatever your favorite smoothing algorithms over it, uh, moving average, and that would just smooth out the bump, the, the, the bump for us. That's not so different to what's happening here, except here we're learning how smooth to make it. This tells us can we move very quickly to get between the two values, or should we move really gently to get between the two values? So all we're doing here is smoothing, but the smoother is controlled by these parameters, and these parameters are learned from the data. So we're learning to be as smooth as natural speech seemed to be. So this whole algorithm, we're not going to look at the maths for it. It's called maximum likelihood parameter generation. So it's still maximum likelihood. That's still the most basic of all principles, but it takes account of the deltas and the delta deltas, the velocities and accelerations. Now, you could probably run an arbitrary simple smoother over it and get very, very similar results. And in DNN synthesis, we might do maximum likelihood parameter generation, we might do very naive smoothing, and we might not find a huge difference. So this is just fancy, fancy smoothing. That's the key. This algorithm is very expensive. Computation is very expensive. Go to the papers, look at the maths. It's lots of big matrix operations because we're solving a complicated equation. We find to find the most likely thing under a big set of constraints over a sequence of hundreds of frames. So we can essentially stack that in some enormous matrix operation and then solve a set of equations as a, some sort of simultaneous matrix operation. And it's not cheap. So that's a reason to avoid it. But it's the standard thing to do. Okay, so... Let's just wrap that up, and we're going to spend the last 10 minutes doing one final topic, which is adaptation. We've talked about unit selection, and we've talked about HMMs. Hopefully, we've seen lots and lots of connections between them. This regression tree is regressing from linguistic features to Gaussians, which we then generate from. It's not a whole lot different to pulling out a bit of speech waveform to pulling out a Gaussian. They're not that different. It's just the Gaussians are distributions but it's the mean is by far the most important part of that distribution. And they've got little durations, and we tend to use subphonetic units rather than diphones. But really, we could see the big regression tree as just a tree-shaped lookup table that says, given this feature, look this thing up, it happens to be a Gaussian, pop it somewhere, we have its duration, and then vocode it. That's not so different to retrieving a fragment of waveform of the right duration with the right features. They're really not so different. So you can see lots of connections between the thing the target cost does, which is just, in, it's probing, it's querying those linguistic features. The, the regression tree is probing or querying those linguistic features. The target cost pulls as a set of candidates out of the database, which we choose between to get a smooth join. But it could just have chosen the top one. 
the regression tree gives us just one set of parameters, effectively a mean. And in order to make that join well to the next thing, we make sure we make a smooth trajectory between them. We don't just concatenate them and do the square thing. We smooth them with this generation algorithm. In unit selection, we choose amongst them those that already naturally have that smooth transition. Okay, before we move on, any last bits of questions on that? Or in speech, uh, in ASR, we use uh, GMM. Can we use that for speech synthesis? So the question is whether you use a, a mixture of Gauss yeah. use as the distribution model in the states. Yes, indeed, well, of course we can do that. Um, let's just draw a picture of why we don't do that, or why we generally don't do that. Here's time. Here's some parameter we're trying to generate from. And I'll just, I hope it's okay, I'm drawing my Gaussian sideways because they're in the, they're the dimension C. So let's imagine we've got this Gaussian at this moment in time and then this Gaussian here, right? And the normal generation algorithm is to draw a nice smooth trajectory joining the dots up like that. Okay with that? If I had a mixture of Gaussians, let's just have two. Imagine I had a mixture distribution here and a mixture distribution here. So it's very badly drawn Gaussians. I've got them sideways. And I've now got to find the most likely trajectory through here. Before, there was only one obvious trajectory, and the simple one was just join the means up, constrained by the velocities and so on. Not so anymore. If we draw the trajectory now, we could join this Gaussian to this Gaussian, or this Gaussian to this Gaussian, or this one to this one, or this one to this one. There's now four paths. And the further we go on, the more paths because each of these could now go through two Gaussians and two Gaussians. So the number of trajectories grows exponentially with the number of frames, which would be a very, very large number. We could actually never do exact computation with such a model. We'd have to do some approximations. SR, this doesn't apply because we just make this extreme and strong Markov assumption. We don't, we're not drawing these trajectories at all. We're just computing independently. But here, we are not doing independent computations. What we do here depends on what happens here. That's why MLPG is expensive. To do MLPG with mixtures is going to be exponentially expensive. In fact, it's not possible to do exactly. So the answer is, in general, probably not going to use mixture distributions. Uh, I have one comment about that. So, yep. so the, there are three versions of parameter generation algorithm. The third one is, so the, the Simon explained is a very basic one. So the third one is based on the EM algorithm, so that we regard that the mixture components are the hidden variable, and then by iterating the EM algorithm, you can find the maximum likelihood to trajectory based with mixture of Gaussians. So it's still possible, but as Simon mentioned, it's more computationally expensive, but it's not as expensive as exponentially expensive. Yeah. And it is implemented in HDS. Right. Any more? Okay, so let's just wrap up and remind ourselves why we're doing parametric models at all, given that unit selection sounds fantastic. And the key, really, is that we can perform principled operations on statistical models that are much harder to perform on recorded speech. And the most interesting of those is adaptation, is to, is to change the model after we've trained it, to make it into a different model. And that's adaptation. So again, we're going to do adaptation in very simple form. We're going to do it with pictures. It's actually a very, very simple idea. Let's start with this idea. Imagine that I've got my distribution of F0. So I've got some data, lots and lots of data, and I've trained a really robust model of, of F0 for a particular state, a particular model, in a particular context. It's trained on hundreds of samples. And I like it. It's robust. Imagine I would now like to make this into a model of somebody else. Before getting to adaptation, uh, I'd just like to say that the biggest advantage of uh, statistical models is that they are very compact. So they can be placed inside very small uh, you know, devices and uh, where we cannot fit a unit selection system. That, that's the main one. Adaptation is still yet not there to, uh, to use it in an in industrial you know, environment. I guess that's true commercially. 
Yeah. But in terms of research, the reason people keep researching statistical yes. models is that we're yes, doing absolutely. I'm studying the now, you're studying the future. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So imagine we've got a statistical model that was uh, needed lots of data to learn. This F0 model is not going to need, need a lot, but it's going to, we would like tens of samples to get a good estimate of this model. So we've estimated its mean and its standard deviation. They're good, solid estimates. This is a nice shaped Gaussian. I would like to make this as a model of some other speaker. But imagine I've only got a very small sample of speech from that speaker, and we just know the average F0 of that speaker. So I just know one value. I can't train a new model from scratch on that data. That's a tiny, tiny amount of data. But what I could do is I could adjust this model. So I could move this model to have the mean of that data, very simply by transforming it. Let's generalize that to some other parameter, and let's not just think about F0, but let's think about uh, capital coefficients, the spectral envelopes, is very high dimensional. And let's think about all the, all the parameters in the model. Let's think about all the different parameters in a very big train HMM. I've got a big statistical model trained on many, many hours of data, and I've got a very small sample of data. I'd like to make this model fit, but it's not big enough to train the model from scratch. What can I do to this model to make it, to maximize the likelihood of this new adaptation data without retraining the model? So this example is for F0 because that's the one-dimensional parameter. It's not a very good example because that's such low dimensionality it would be easy. Let's imagine this was all in high dimensions. We have a well-trained high-dimensional Gaussian, in fact lots and lots of them. And we have a small set of data points, some adaptation data from a new, let's say, speaker, a new individual. And we want to make the model a good fit to the speaker. But we don't have enough to retrain the whole model. Conceptually, what we're going to do is going to warp the distributions. We're going to perform transformations to the distributions to make it fit this new data. Now, it's not completely obvious in that why we can't just retrain on the, on the new data. So we'll make that clear as we go along in a minute. What sort of transformations might we think of applying? We're going to keep them simple because we've got to be able to learn them on a very small amount of data. We're going to learn very simple linear transformations. So the most simple linear transformation is just a shift. Which just we could just add something to the mean. So we need to learn a number of parameters equal to the size of the mean and add that. That's one thing we can do. If you're paying attention, you'll see, so I've written here one of the means in my huge Gaussians in my big train models. It's indexed like this. I, so the I range is over thousands and thousands of Gaussians that I've trained all the leaves of my regression trees. And if you're sharp eye, you'll have seen that the thing that I'm going to transform it by, the offset, is not indexed by i, it's indexed by something else, and there's going to be a lot fewer of these than there are. So the number of values of k is going to be a lot, lot smaller than the number of values of i. We'll see how that works in a minute. That's crucial. If it was of the same number as i, we could just train the model from scratch. Maybe the, the adaptation would need as much data. But So we can take a very small set of transforms, here they're just shifts, and apply them to a model with a very large set of parameters. That's the key, is that the number of transform parameters is very small compared to the number of model parameters. A shift is a rather basic transform. It, we could do something like shift the pitch range, but that's all. We could then apply a more sophisticated transform. So we might multiply by a matrix. Multiplying by a matrix can do things like rotations and shears and scaling. So we can expand everything and shrink everything or shear it. And if we combine multiply by matrix with adding an offset, we have an arbitrary set of linear transforms. We can move things all around in the space. So these are a set of linear transforms. So we're going to apply linear transforms. In other words, every single parameter in the model, just think of the means. This is easy to think of the means. Every mean in the model, which we've already said is not that different from a little fragment of waveform in the unit selection database. It's a little fragment of speech sound ready for vocoding. We're going to move them all around in acoustic space. We're going to move them all to the left a bit. We're going to make everything expand a bit. We're just going to rotate things a little bit. Maybe someone's vowel space is a bit different and needs to be a bit rotated. We're going to learn these transforms from adaptation data. So we're going to have to have a transform for every single model parameter, but the number of transforms is obviously going to be much smaller. So we're going to have a small number of transforms, and the transforms are going to apply to whole classes of parameters. Let's think of a simple example. Let's go straight to the picture. Let's imagine we've got our well-trained HMM synthesizer with all the big regression trees. 
These are the Gaussians at the leaves of the regression trees. And let's imagine that there are only in this language there's vowels and there's consonants. So maybe these are the vowels and these are the consonants. They happen to fall like this in acoustic space. And if we're going to apply some transform to these, we're going to move them all around, we might apply the same transform to all the vowels and some other different transform to all the consonants. So we've just got two transforms, but eight model parameters. And in reality, we wouldn't have eight, we'd have 8,000 or 80,000. So we form these things into classes. You can learn that from the data. You'll be unsurprised to hear we do that by clustering them with a tree. We like trees. We cluster these things into a tree, forming these classes known as regression classes. And then we just apply a linear transform to every model parameter. So these are these things. These are the transformed things. And that's the matrix and the vector of the transform. And this and this belong to the regression classes. So there are two sets of those things. So the number of values of k is far, far smaller than the number of values of i. And we can just apply these affine transforms. Here I'm just going to apply a shift and a rotation, but we could also stretch and shear and scale. So we just move things through acoustic space with these linear transforms. And that transform is just learned by looking at the adaptation data and the model parameters and maximizing the likelihood. And because all these parameters belong to classes, they all get transformed. So every single one of the thousands and thousands of model parameters changes, but the whole groups of parameters are changing in the same way. And then the limit, with a very, very tiny amount of adaptation data, we might just learn a single transform that applies to every single model parameter. That's the simplest possible transform. And that will have a very tiny number of parameters in that transform. One matrix of the same dimensionality as the observation vector, and one offset vector of the same dimensionality. So a very, very tiny number. We could learn it even on one sentence. And it would do an approximate job of transforming the model to sound like, say, a new speaker or expression. And the model parameters, let's not draw the classes. So it looks like a very complicated nonlinear transform happens to the model. The entire model changes. Everything in the model changes, but the transform is structured in this special way. So you can use that technique. Those transforms are learned automatically with respect to some adaptation data. We adapt a model that's been previously trained, and it's just up to us, it's a design choice, on what that model is and what that adaptation data is. An obvious example would be that the model is trained on many speakers, so it's speaker independent, and that the adaptation data of some one particular new speaker is speaker dependent, and we make a speaker dependent model from a speaker independent model with a very, very small amount of data, maybe 10 sentences or 100 sentences, something we could never build a good system on. But we'll get a very good system because the underlying models train on a large amount of data. And you can expand that to a, an expression-independent model to make expression-dependent, emotion-independent model to emotion-dependent, and so on and so forth. There's any number of things we could do with adaptation. The limit is your imagination. So let's just wrap up. And I'd like to look ahead to what you're going to hear about a little bit later on. I think it's uh, tomorrow morning. Just to make the link on to DNN synthesis. Here's the picture of HMM synthesis. And deliberately, most of the picture is a regression tree. And there's a little bit of stuff happening here. And there's a front end happening here. But all the action is here in a big regression tree. If it's a regression tree that's doing all the work, and if the problem is regression, we can immediately ask ourselves, why on earth did we choose a regression tree? Regression trees are ancient, old-fashioned, and make very inefficient use of the data. When we learn a regression tree, we start with all the training data here, and we do a very, very bad thing. We make the data smaller and smaller. We train on less and less data as we go down the tree. So deep down the tree, it's obviously going to be much deeper than this, several levels down the tree, somewhere when we're growing the tree here, we're saying, which question should we use to split the data of all the remaining few hundred questions? The data we're thinking of splitting is a tiny subset of the original training data. So we're going to make very poor decisions because we've just thrown away a lot of the data. We're not using all the data. So it's not a very clever regression model. It's got advantages, such as it's very, very fast at runtime. It's human readable, if you like to read that kind of thing. But 
Otherwise, it's a poor choice of regression model. So pick a different one. Pick any other regression model you like, and the choice of the moment is the neural network. It's the most generalized regression model we can think of. Think of it as a, non -learn a learnable regression model, a nonlinear regression model. And so we're just going to insert a neural network where there used to be regression trees, and everything else will be pretty much the same. Okay. Is the end of that? <laughs>